Okay. I am supposed to be speaking about the future of Mediterranean rocky reefs, but uh, since predicting the future is always a very risky business, so I, I will be probably more talking about the past events and the present. And, uh, but I also wanted to um, raise some concern and find some red lights on uh, for the possible future three that maybe we are overlooking. Uh, in the Mediterranean, when you see sea urchin, you always uh, think about uh, Paracentratus libidus. And that's uh, logical because uh, Paracentratus libidus is the most abundant, uh, is edible, commercially important, and uh, ecologically important. Uh, but um, we, uh, we have a, a second sea urchin in the Mediterranean, that is Arbacia dixula. It's a black sea urchin or the Erizo Cachero in the Canary Islands. And, uh, uh, well, it's uh, less abundant than Paracentrotus. In the in Catalan coast, it's almost uh, one tenth uh, of the abundance of, of Paracentrotus. It has no commercial value since it's untested. Uh, not even the Japanese <laughs> eat them. <laughs> and, and, uh, of course, much ecological research uh, has been done with uh, Paracentrotus libidus. Um, but very few uh, experimental research have been uh, done directly with uh, uh, using Arbacia lixula. So many of the facts that we know, or we think that we know about Arbacia lixula are actually extrapolated from some other experiments with, uh, from Paracentrotus libidus or other sea actions. Just, uh, assuming that uh, all the sea urchins behave more or less the same. Uh, so uh, what we, we believed uh, about Arbacia lixula when we first uh, um, uh, think about the studying it, well, it was a typical representative uh, of Mediterranean fauna. Of course, it's the, the second most abundant echinoid in the shallow rocky habitats. Uh, we thought that it was herbivorous, of course, uh, everybody knows that uh, sea urchins are herbivorous. And uh, if you lo uh, look at the bibliography, they say that the way uh, Arbacia was uh, feeding on encrusting coralline algae, where uh, Paracentrotus fed more in erect algae, and, uh, well, and Posidonia and everything. And, uh, so uh, we thought that it played just a supporting role in creating barren zones, but Paracentrotus libidus was the main actor. And of course, uh, well, um, we, we knew that it had an annual reproductive cycle because there was a paper in uh, uh, 68, 1968 by Lucien Fenot. That's the only paper on the reproductive cycle in, of Arabasia de in the Mediterranean. Uh, of course, it uh, has a long life plantotrophic larvae of high dispersal capacity. And uh, some authors have suggested this Thermophilus origin uh, for uh, that, uh, well, because of its uh, area uh, of distribution. Uh, in fact, the uh, genus Arbacia uh, came from America, mostly from tropical America. Uh, and uh, Arbacia lixula is the only species in the genus that lives in, in, in the old world, in, in Europe, in the Mediterranean, and in the coast of Africa, and Macaronis and Archipelagos. And it also lives in the coast of, of Brazil. And uh, thanks to a, work, a recent work by Lesios et al., where we know that the sister species of Arbacia lixula is Arbacia punctulatus uh, from the Caribbean. So uh, probably uh, the the, the sequence, the history of the, the, the crossing of the Atlantic uh, from the Caribbean to probably Macaronesian or, or the uh, east, uh, western coast of, uh, of Africa from the, where uh, it entered the Mediterranean and then it came to Brazil. Well, that's uh, one of the possible stories. Well, our research planning that uh, eventually became my, the subject of my PhD work uh, was centered in using mm, new, new technologies and new, new analytical methods uh, to test if the facts that we knew about Arbacia was right. 
so uh, we use a stable isotopes analysis to do a traffic ecology uh, experiment. And uh, then we did a um, phylogeography experiment with a, a wide set of, of samples. And uh, we wanted to do a long chain follow-up of four years on the reproductive cycle. And after that, we wanted to know the resilience of the climate change in, in larvas and cellars that are uh, possible the, the most uh, uh, feeble, uh, well, the, 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 well the, the, the cycle, well, the, the most feeble part of the cycle. Well, uh, in, with the results, uh, in, in, in the stable isotopes analysis, we found something very surprising. Actually, we found that the uh, Arbacea lixula uh, was with the carnivores. Uh, this is the signature of 15 nitrogen that uh, uh, tells the trophic level of, uh, of the species. And uh, if uh, Arbacea lixula was feeding in coralline, uh, in crustean coralline algae, this is lithophilum. So uh, probably, it, uh, if, it, uh, if Arbacea was feeding on that, it will be around here, but actually it's around here. So it's uh, a carnivore, uh, uh, and it's, uh, it has a signature uh, uh, like that of Actinia, Echina, or Marsasterius glacialis, so it's quite carnivorous. Uh, we uh, mm, tested, uh, uh, I think that it, uh, that, fine. yeah, well, that's fine. We tested this pattern uh, over time in, uh, in one, oops, in one locality at Tosa de Mar, and the pattern was consistent over one year. The Arbacea was always uh, more carnivorous than Paracentrotus. And we also tested it uh, in four locations around the Mediterranean coast and the, here in Tenerife. And always Arbacea lixula was one trophic level higher uh, than Paracentrotus. So the, the conclusion is that Arbacea lixula is a carnivore. Uh, it's not uh, eating coralline algae. Uh, it's eating small animals, sessile animals, and uh, even some uh, moving animals. And uh, well, it's, so it's trophic ecology may be very different of that of Paracentotus libidus. Uh, to talk of a trophic competition between Arbacea and Paracentotus is more or less like talk about competition between lion and zebras. Uh, well, what about the second, uh, the second experiment? Well, we, we wanted to, to test the, the history of the, the past history of the populations of, of Arbacea. So we designed a, a sampling in 24 localities in three regions, in Brazil, in the Eastern Atlantic Ocean, and in, the, in three of the basins of the Mediterranean. Uh, with a total of more than 600 individuals, so quite consistent. And uh, we found uh, several things, but uh, we found an uh, extreme uh, aplotype diversity, and uh, these aplotypes uh, were organized in the aplotype network that had a star-like uh, topology. This star-like topology, especially the haplogroup A and haplogroup B, uh, has a, a striking starlight topology that is, uh, it suggests that the, these populations have suffer, suffered a very recent uh, uh, demo, demographic expansion. So, uh, we also did the differentiation measures uh, between the pairs of populations. Well, there's a, a lot of things here, but the uh, the red marks, uh, the, the pairs of population that are genetically different. Uh, so what is interesting here is that in the Mediterranean, this uh, strong, uh, the, this big square, oops, this big square is uh, the per, uh, population pairs of the Mediterranean, and there's no difference at all between any pair of uh, Mediterranean populations. That uh, could be due uh, to, because in the in Mediterranean there's only one pangmictic population that is very improbable because the uh, results with another, uh, other canadens 
so very, very different, uh, well, so that the different basins uh, are not uh, genetically connected. And the other possible explanation is that uh, the Mediterranean population is very recent and it uh, hasn't had enough time to differentiate. So, uh, actually, uh, well, we, we can date, uh, if, if we do the mismatch distribution analysis, we can do, uh, using the theory of the demographic inference, uh, well, we can do, if this, uh, the, if this mismatch distribution analysis uh, has uh, a single peak, that is unimodal, then it uh, suggests that the population has suffered an uh, expansion. This is coherent with the uh, Aflotype network. And we can date, uh, well, we observe a demographic expansion in the Eastern Atlantic population and Mediterranean, but not in the Brazilian population. And the best thing is that we can date this expansion from the position of the maximum if we know the mutation rate that uh, and we know it very, very good uh, for the, the mutation rate for the echinocytochrome uh, CS1. Uh, and uh, we can say that this uh, expansion, this demographic expansion in the Mediterranean took place very recently, uh, between 90 and 200,000 years in the Mediterranean. That's uh, quite re uh, recent uh, compared to other it cannot answer of uh, Atlanta Mediterranean distribution. Uh, well, some, some of them has uh, expansion time from 600,000, 900,000, but uh, well, we ne never found uh, one, one species in the Mediterranean that uh, had a, a, a demographic expansion so recent. So uh, the paleontological evidence also uh, said that the Arvaseric Sula is very recent in the Mediterranean. Uh, if we look at the fossil record of Paracentrotus, uh, there's a lot of uh, records all along the Mediterranean. From seven million years, they are present in the Mediterranean. But the Arvaseric Sula fossil record is this. There's only one individual reported from, the, um, from Livorno in Italy by Stefanini in uh, 1911, and another one individual from Madeira in the same paper by Stefanini, and then 100 years later, the Madeira et al. reported some 30 individuals from the Azores Island. So uh, the Mediterranean is uh, uh, an area that has, has been very sampled by paleontologists. Uh, so it probably if uh, Arbacia Lixula had been there, they had found it. Uh, when uh, the expansion event uh, are related with the, with the temperature changes, well, uh, this is a representation of the isotopic stages of uh, oxygen isotope that is uh, related with temperature. So uh, we can see the glacial events here and the interglacial events. And the Livorno fossil and the uh, fossils in the Azores. And, and our estimation for the demographic expansion in the Mediterranean from the molecular data uh, are coherent with the view that the uh, Arvasia lixula entered the Mediterranean uh, as recent as in the last interglacial period in the Amian or Sangamonian. Uh, the, is the, actually the uh, Ries Boone interglacial. That, uh, it, it was the, dated uh, about uh, 130 uh, years, uh, thousand years ago. <laughs> okay, so uh, the conclusion is that uh, despite its abundance, Arvasia Lixula is a very recent colonizer of the Mediterranean and it's a very successful colonizer. It's a, uh, so successful that uh, uh, we didn't know that it was a, a colonizer even. We thought that uh, it was a, a typical representative of our fauna. Well, about the reproductive cycle, um, we made this uh, four-year follow-up in one location in the northwestern Mediterranean, in Tosa de Mar. And uh, we were very lucky because we had two years of cold temperatures and two years of high temperatures. And then uh, what we found is that uh, the reproductive cycle 
is uh, mm, very dependent on temperature. So uh, it, it has an annual peak, of course, that uh, it, uh, and the peak uh, is during the warmer month, it's April, May, June, July. So the, the peak corresponds to the warmer month. And uh, the thing is that we, we can uh, uh, find, uh, find a correlation between the, the, the highest, uh, well, the, the height of the peak and the mean temperature during the uh, growing months. So uh, it, if we do this correlation, uh, this is, oh, I think that the, the, the access is just for the Mac. <laughs> I did it in Windows. Okay. <laughs> okay, here is the mean temperature of the six months previous to the peak, you know, the growing period. Uh, and this is the, the maximum gonadosomatic index. And um, well, there are a big correlation with a correlation coefficient of well, a regression coefficient of 0.92, so it's, it's uh, quite high for an ecological uh, experiment. And uh, this is current with uh, results obtained by other uh, Italian groups, and you say uh, et al. Uh, showed uh, also a positive correlation with the temperature in Ustica Island in Italy. And, Okay, so the conclusion is that Vasia Lixula is indeed a thermophilus urchin, and that the small variation, that the uh, one degree in the mean, mean water temperature may boost his fecundity, is going to have somatic index, more than two times. Well, what about the future? Uh, we wanted to test the resilience against warming and acidification, so uh, I, I went to Sweden to see Sand Dupont there. Uh, I passed uh, three months there and made some experiment with herbacea lixula larvae. Uh, these are preliminary re results. Uh, it uh, ended just uh, one week ago, so, uh, and, and we don't have uh, had enough time to, to look at the, at the results, but well, I wanted to, to comment because there are some nice uh, results with the larval survival with temperature. So we, we tried th three different temperatures, and uh, we saw that the larval survive, uh, the larval survival was uh, related to the temperature. They, of course, they they survive more uh, with higher temperatures, and also the pH, uh, the low pH didn't seem to affect them very very much. We only tried this pH at 7.7. .7. That's not a extreme. Uh, acidic pH, but well, uh, they survive a lot, uh, a lot like, like uh, the control ones. And uh, after uh, 40 to 50 days, we obtained some settlers that then they settled spontaneously in the barrels. And we also tested with these settlers, we tested the effect of acidification. We made a little experiment. We put a uh, uh, normal grown uh, settlers in normal water or acidic and acid grown settlers in normal water and, or, or acidic and we did not find any signification in the, well, any difference in the survival so probably the, the, this pH of 7.7 .7 doesn't affect them. So uh, the conclusion of this is that the larva uh, will probably be favored by warmer water temperatures that was the the, there will, uh, will be the, the temperatures in the Mediterranean in the near future, and the settlers may be unaffected by a low degree of acidification. So, uh, probably, the, uh, the, uh, there was an increase in the density of larvae and in the density of settlers in the future. So, uh, there are some ecological results also with uh, relating uh, Arbacea lixula and Barrens. That's not mine, that's from mostly from uh, Italian ecologists, that uh, found a positive correlation between herbacea sexual densities and barren ground expansion uh, in Italy and in the, well, in, in the north and in the south of Italy. The Pivitera et al. suggested a positive feedback between herbacea and barrens. 
And, uh, and they uh, also said that, that the Arbacia lixula alone can form barrens in the south of Italy. Uh, so, uh, Arbacia lixula may have a more active role than previously thought in the formation of barrens in the Mediterranean. Uh, also, uh, we know that uh, Arbacia lixula has already increased its population in the recent past. Uh, the, in, in the Gulf of Lyon, that is the coldest part of the Mediterranean, in 1883, Marion described it as very rare, but in the 50s, Petit et al. Uh, reported that it had become very abundant during a period of 30 uh, years. Also, Francur et al. reported a 12-fold increase in Corsica over, over nine years. And during the same period, During the same period, uh, Harmeling et al. reported uh, also an increase at Port Cross Marine Reserve. And in the Eastern Mediterranean Basin, uh, well, uh, in, in 1928, uh, Isel reported San Arbacia Lixula at uh, the island of Kos, but, but Tortonese uh, failed to find it during samples for Echino and Fauna of Rhodes. And, uh, they, uh, well, Tortonese stated that he was actively looking for, uh, for it, and Tortonese was the um, very big uh, uh, expert in Mediterranean fauna at, the, uh, at that time. Uh, but nowadays it's very abundant throughout the Aegean Sea and uh, also present in the Nile Delta and Israel, so it's becoming more abundant in that zone. So some scary facts uh, as a summary. <coughs> Arbacia lixula is a voracious carnivorous that bulldozes a straight uh, and, and it originates barrens. It has a remarkable colonization ability. Uh, it has colonized all the Mediterranean in just 100,000 years. Uh, its fecundity can be increased by uh, uh, warmer temperatures. Its larval survival rates will increase and the survival of the settlers probably will be unaffected. So uh, I don't want to scare you, but uh, maybe in the future, <laughs> maybe in the future we, we can have from, we, we can pass from this typical Mediterranean paradise to this Arbacia barren. So thank you very much. And that's all.